What's up guys? My name's Steve and this is my 1995 Toyota Supra. Pretty much got into cars at a young age. My dad was into cars, never really owned anything super cool. He had a lot of posters of like Corvettes and cars he was into, old cars, always playing video games that had cars in them. So I chose a Supra over any of the other legends, basically because of obtainability. R34 GTR is in my eyes, you know, not obtainable. It's too expensive. And it's just something that I kind of consider out of reach for most people. The Supra has always been one of my favorite cars as well. And so to be able to, to get one, it was, you know, definitely a dream come true. So my first ever car was a 96 Honda Civic and it was a four door automatic. I ended up doing a couple things to it, lowering it, I don't know, some parts from Pet Boys on it. <laughs> I got a, another Civic, but it was a two door and it was a five speed. Did a little bit to that one and then shortly after was I think when I ended up with the RSX Type S. I had a 1G Eclipse uh, that I used to commute to work. Uh, that was automatic, but it was in really good condition. Everything worked on it, had AC, and so I just drive it back and forth to work problem-free for like two years. Uh, I actually would love to own uh, a 99 or maybe 98 GSX. Uh, that's also one of the cars that I've, I've always loved growing up and, and as a kid. And so I think if I ever, you know, got into a situation where I could, could own one for a good fair price, I would jump on it. Back then, you know, going through time, having a kid at a fairly young age, 25, you're, you can only afford, you know, so many different things. So I had the Eclipse for a while, I got rid of that. I actually had a 94 MR2 Turbo for a very short time and I ended up selling it. Might have landed then on the Hyundai Genesis Coupe. Um, that was a car that I thought was, it was fun. I mean, I got the 3.8, the V6, so it had decent amount of power. Did a couple of mods to that, drove it for a while. And uh, when I got more or less kind of bored of it, I think is when I jumped back into an Evo. With the Evo, I, it was already a built car when I got it. It had a transmission that was pretty bad, really notchy, hard to get into fourth gear. Uh, it would grind a lot, a lot of issues. Trying to go from, I think, third to fourth and then money shifted into second because the transmission was so notchy. And when that happened, the motor just seemed, didn't seem the same after, it seemed like it was hurt. We ended up doing, I think, a leak down compression test and found out that it needed to be rebuilt. So that started the rebuilding process. And from there, it just kind of became a snowball effect. Well, if I'm gonna have a built motor, might as well do aluminum rods. Well, if I'm gonna do that, might as well get the biggest turbo that we can throw on this thing. Might as well do custom, you know, fender exit exhaust and talking to more and more people and getting more and more ideas, I just kind of started running wild with it. But to me, that was actually the downfall of the car is because I went too crazy to the point where it was, okay, this is just a straight up drag car now and you can only use it for one thing. And as fun as a drag car is, it's a very expensive hobby where you're literally spending all this money to build something that you're gonna go use and race and then it's just gonna break and then you gotta fix it again and break, fix, repeat and same thing over and over. So I ended up, you know, walking away from it. And I parted it out because I knew that's where all the value was. No one's gonna buy this drag build for top dollar. Just listed the, the parts for sale on the Evo forums and like within minutes or hours, people were like, can I have this, can I have that? And they were selling for my asking price. So I just started saying yes, and the next thing you know, within like two days, I had sold probably 75% of the car. So at that point, there was really no, no turning back from it, and uh, I had made enough money to pay for the RX-7 with that. Um, as far as the Supra goes, I had a buddy who's in Arizona, met him through the Evo world. He actually still owns an Evo or maybe two today. 
and I just kind of noticed as he was always posting videos online, his back up his Evo out of the garage, pull it in, there's always this red Supra sitting in the garage. And so at first it was kind of like a fooling around kind of thing. Hey bro, let me get that Supra. And you know, he'd probably write back, ha ha, or whatever, stuff like that. And we kind of went through that for, I don't know, maybe nine months to a year. And it finally got to the point where I think one day he's like, do you really want to buy or are you just fooling around? And I was like, I would possibly really want to buy it if, you know, the price is right. I never thought I'd really own a Supra. They're not the cheapest cars around. He gave me the numbers and I said, you know what, it's actually not that bad. Let me see what I can do. And so I just decided, you know what, I'm going to make it happen. I actually, one thing that's pretty funny about the whole thing is I didn't say a word to my wife. And I went and I, I got the money actually from a credit union and I went and I bought the car and trailered it home. And I was like, surprise, <laughs> we have an investment for the future because I thought it would be a good purchase and they would go up in the future. My wife was not really happy. She was like, for you to go buy a major purchase that's thousands of dollars and not even say a word to me, she's like, that's what kind of pisses me off the most. She's like, I don't really care you know, about the car, it looks, looks like it's cool or whatever. I've heard Supra, I know people love the car and all that stuff, but for her it was more about just not communicating and not saying anything and just doing it. And I just said that the only reason why I didn't say anything was because I didn't want you to say no and not let me get it, so I just went and did it. <laughs> The next thing was me driving the car and it started smoking. It was smoking a lot out of the catch can and it just seemed kind of excessive. So it was actually Jeff who helped me and we did a, a leak down on it. We did a compression test. We basically found that one of the cylinders was low on compression. More than likely it was the uh, piston rings and instead of just throwing in some new piston rings, because this was an OEM uh, bottom end, and leaving it stock, I just decided, you know what, we're just gonna do like a mild build on it, nothing crazy. And that's how I got uh, into building the motor. And with the build motor, I just decided, you know what, it's gonna be a uh, way better flow and everything if we build the head. So we ended up building the head at the same time. When I bought the Supra, it had a Ford nine inch rear end, a turbo 400 transmission, pretty much built to be a drag car. Having all those experiences with the Evo and knowing what you're you know, going towards when you're doing a drag build, I just wanted to step away from that. So I decided to get the car into uh, Ryan, who owns RS Performance, into his hands. And I just said, hey, let's uh, do a built motor on this thing. Um, his brother had a V160, which is a, a OEM uh, twin turbo six speed transmission. He had a, uh, a TRD rear diff. And so I just said, let's just take everything out of my car since your brother wants to do a full drag Supra, throw it in his car, and then you go ahead and throw all his parts in mine. And they were up for doing that trade because it worked out for both of us. And so that's how it, it got changed to more of like a, you know, a street car that it is now. And so that's when the car was actually purple. Then as we started to go uh, towards a street build, I wanted to, to get rid of the weld setup and get rid of the whole dragster look. Um, so I ended up getting the work wheels with the Toyo tires. The power output right now is about 800, 810, somewhere right around there to the wheel. Um, the potential is up to 1200. The current turbo that I have right now, the, uh, the exhaust housing on it is a little bit too small. So it starts to kind of choke out at high RPMs. And really once you turn up the boost on it, it's not really making more power. So my tuner just told me, if you throw on a bigger turbo, you can make well over a thousand all day. But I kind of feel like it's good where it's at. So for the exterior, I have the Carbonetix front lip in a forged carbon. I have a Saibon carbon fiber hood. It has a Shine Auto project, makes the side skirts and the rear diffuser. They're a, a, a top secret 
style. Plate garnish in carbon fiber, and then you have the exhaust heat shield that's by a company called Prospec Imports. Carbon fiber center blade and the carbon fiber caps on the wing. The wheels are 18 inch Workmeisters. The wrap on the interior of the car, we have a uh, the dash kit that's basically like skinned in, car in a carbon fiber. Um, you have the BTI gauge in there that uh, monitors all the boosts. You have the, the bride seats, they're the Vertex limited edition model. Uh, the Zeta 3s is what they are. And then you have the Takata harnesses and the sound performance harness bar. So under the hood you have, it's still a 3.0 liter 2J. It's got uh, CP pistons, it's got manly rods. It has the Titan Motorsports billet main caps. And in the head, you have BC Racing cams, valve springs and retainers, I believe it's titanium. Intake manifold and exhaust manifold are both made by a company uh, called Sound Performance, who's out in Chicago. A 6870 turbo precision, um, 2000 cc injectors, aftermarket fuel rail, I wanna say radium. Two Walbro 525 uh, fuel pumps. Fuel lines, obviously, that were replaced that are bigger. I want to say dash 10 feed, dash 8 return. Custom hydro dipped parts that are in a carbon fiber pattern. Uh, what it's like driving a Supra is basically driving a people magnet. You get a lot of eyes on you, a lot of people that, you know, are just looking at the car, a lot of thumbs up and a lot of love for the car. So I think that's one of the things I like the most about it is that there's so many people that are fans of the car and you just feel that when you're driving it. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's a thrill pretty much every time you drive it, so I really enjoy it. Uh, for all the young kids that are watching that want a Supra or the Supra is your dream car, my advice would be just make it your goal to get one. Uh, don't let people tell you that it's something that you can never own because they're too expensive or you know they're out of someone's price range. and. I mean, it may not be the cheapest car. You may not find one for ten or twenty thousand dollars like you used to in the past, but that definitely doesn't mean that you can't make it your dream, your dream car, and just work as hard as you can. So that way, when you grow up and you're older, you can actually, you know, afford one and make it happen. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed uh, learning a little bit about the build of this car. And if you want to uh, see more videos, more content, or just anything that I post about it, my Instagram is Supra underscore Dorito. And you can join me there and follow my adventures.